talk about a common scenario which a lot of you may face either in the outpatient or in the emergency room sometime. Let's say a 65 year old gentleman walks in and says that he's been having chest discomfort over the last one hour and he's sweating a little bit and feeling dizzy and generally not feeling very well. This is a scenario which can often evoke certain amount of nervousness and panic in the treating doctor. And uh, if I ask you, what is the one investigation which you are likely to order? I'm sure most of you would say that, well, someone comes with chest pain, I would like to take an ECG. That's all good. And the next step, of course, is to be able to interpret that ECG. So that's where, again, a lot of uncertainty and anxiety comes in. And therefore, the aim of this talk will be to try and look at some of the more salient features in interpreting an ECG in ischemic heart disease. This is a very common condition which most of you are likely to encounter in clinical practice. And that's something which everyone needs to have a good handle on. So we all know that ischemic heart disease is a pretty important cause of both death and disability in our country. What does ischemia mean? Ischemia means the condition resulting from a lack of blood supply to the myocardium or the heart muscle. And what this creates is an imbalance between oxygen supply and demand. The most common cause of ischemic heart disease and the one which we are going to encounter clinically is basically an obstruction of the epicardial coronary arteries and therefore it's also commonly referred to as coronary artery disease. To be able to have a good understanding of ECG interpretation, one needs to have the anatomy of the coronary arteries in, the, in mind. As you know, there are majorly two coronary arteries, the left and the right coronary artery. And furthermore, the left coronary artery divides into two important branches, the left anterior descending or the LAD. This predominantly supplies the septum and the anterior wall of the left ventricle and the left circumflex artery, which more supplies the lateral and the posterior walls. The right coronary artery, again, mainly supplies the inferior wall of the left ventricle, as well as to some extent the posterior and sometimes the lateral surfaces of the heart. Now, this is important because depending on the area of the muscle which is affected, different ECG leads would show problems. And based on that, you can then correlate it with cardiac anatomy and understand which region of the ventricle is affected as well as which might be the potential culprit coronary artery which is involved. As far as the ECG manifestations are concerned in ischemic heart disease, it's important to know that it should always be viewed in context of the clinical presentation. And it's good to keep in mind what the various different clinical presentations of ischemic heart disease can be. Essentially, it's either stable ischemic heart disease which means that there is no acute crisis ongoing at present, or it could be one of the acute coronary syndromes. And acute coronary syndromes essentially are divided into the broad category of either unstable angina or myocardial infarction. For the purposes of ECG interpretation, it's useful to club unstable angina and non-ST elevation myocardial infarction into one category and the ST elevation myocardial infarction into the other category. We'll look at stable IHD. One of the important things to remember about stable ischemic heart disease is that the resting ECG may not show any abnormalities. And uh, what do you think could be the reason for that? Let's say someone has an obstruction in his coronary arteries. He has come for an evaluation. He doesn't have acute ongoing pain at that point of time. And essentially, the ECG at that time can be normal. And the reason for that is that many times ischemia is provoked only when the heart is placed under stress in such conditions. And therefore, the normal rest ECG may not necessarily rule out presence of ischemic heart disease in such individuals. It could sometimes show only subtle abnormalities such as subtle STT changes. So that's one important thing to remember. Do not dismiss a normal resting ECG as ruling out ischemic heart disease. These patients, depending on the clinical history, may sometimes need to be put through a stress test such as a treadmill or a bicycle test in order to provoke significant ischemic changes on the ECG. The other basic concept to remember is ischemia versus infarction. Ischemia is a situation where blood flow is reduced 
and the myocardium is threatened. Infarction is the end product of it where because of prolonged lack of blood supply, the muscle has completely died or infarcted. Now, as far as the ECG is concerned, ischemia mainly affects repolarization and predominantly would be characterized by changes affecting the ST segment and the T wave, which basically correspond to repolarization. On the other hand, completed infarct mainly affects the myocardial depolarization and therefore changes the QRS complex. So, putting all these things together, what are the various waves in an ECG which can be affected by ischemic heart disease? So, obviously, it can affect the QRS complex. The main changes which we need to talk about in the QRS complex are Q waves and a finding called QRS fragmentation. It can affect the T waves as part of repolarization abnormalities. And the two main changes which it can bring about are T wave inversion and something called hyperacute T waves. And lastly, it can affect the ST segment, causing either depression or elevation. Now, let's look at some of these findings. What is a Q wave? By definition, a Q wave is basically a first negative deflection in a QRS. In other words, the negative deflection should be the first event in the QRS. So it's important to remember that if, the, if a negative deflection follows an R wave, then that becomes an S wave and it's not a Q wave. So a Q wave is a negative deflection occurring as the first event in a QRS. And what does a Q wave indicate? It simply means that a prior myocardial infarction with scar has occurred in a particular region of the heart. Now, sometimes you can find very small amplitude Q waves which can be part of a normal variation in an ECG. And therefore, certain criteria have been set forth to define pathological Q waves. So one of the commonly used definitions is that the presence of a Q wave of any magnitude in leads V1 to V3 is significant. In other leads, the Q wave should be at least 0.04 seconds in duration. In other words, it should cover one small square of the ECG. And it should be at least 2 millimeters deep. Or basically, in, in other criteria, it's also stated that it should be at least 25% of the succeeding R wave height. So these uh, measurements which tell you that this is unlikely to be a normal variant and it's actually a pathological Q wave. Another important information conveyed by the Q wave is that it localizes the involved territory of the myocardium. And how do you localize it? You localize it by looking at the leads which are showing the Q waves. If V1 and V2 display Q waves, it's either a septal or an anteroseptal location. If V3 and V4 display Q waves, then it's an anterior territory which is involved. Similarly, if V5, V6, 1 and AVL are involved, then it basically corresponds to a lateral infarct. If mainly the inferior leads, 2, 3 and AVF display Q waves, then it conveys a previous inferior infarct. This is an example of an old anteroseptal MI. You can see circled in green the Q waves which are present in V1 and V2. Now note that in lead V3, there is no complete Q wave because there is a small positive deflection or an R wave initially. So this has been put up just to show that sometimes with infarcts of a smaller magnitude, you may not develop a complete Q wave, but all that could happen is a reduction in the amplitude of the R wave. And this is sometimes referred to as a poor R wave progression. This is also something which you should look for and keep in mind when you're thinking of a previous infarct in a ECG. Now, an interesting finding which one needs to think of is in a situation of posterior wall myocardial infarction. Now, in the previous ECG, we saw that if the anterior wall is infarcted, the leads which face the anterior wall, namely V1 to V3 or V1 to V4, would show Q waves. What's going to happen if the exact opposite wall, the posterior wall, is infarcted? If you think about it, we are not generally placing leads facing the posterior aspect of the heart. But we can get a clue by seeing that the anterior leads are going to reflect changes which are a mirror image of what the posterior leads would show. And therefore, you would find paradoxically tall R waves in the anterior leads V1, V2 and V3. And these would reflect the presence of a posterior wall 
myocardial infarction. So this is what is being shown to you in this picture where you can see this abnormally tall looking R wave in V1 as well as in V2 which you generally don't find in a normal ECG. When you look at this, think of the fact that it could be reflecting an old posterior wall myocardial infarction. The other finding which could be seen as far as the QRS complex pathology is concerned in ischemic heart disease is a phenomenon known as QRS fragmentation. And this essentially is what the name reflects. This is basically a fragmented appearance of the QRS complex. And again, certain criteria have been evolved in order to define what would be considered significant QRS fragmentation. So if you have an additional R wave called an R prime, or if you have a notching in the nadir of the S wave, or if you have a presence of more than one R prime in at least two contiguous leads, then it is basically satisfying the definition of QRS fragmentation. And what is meant by two contiguous leads? Basically, they should be leads which correspond to a similar anatomic territory. For example, you could have it in two of the anterior leads or two of the inferior leads or two of the lateral leads. But the presence of dissociated findings, for example, in one anterior lead and one lateral lead would not satisfy this definition. Why does QRS fragmentation occur? It is basically thought to represent slow and altered conduction via scar tissue, resulting in a breakup of the wave pattern, leading to this fragmented appearance. In this ECG, you can look at the presence of fragmentation, which is present in almost all of the anterior leads and also in the inferior leads. So there is extensive QRS fragmentation here. And this gives you a clue that there is significant amount of scarring in the heart. An important thing to keep in mind is that sometimes QRS fragmentation can also occur in conditions other than ischemic heart disease which lead to scarring in the heart. Let's come to some of the repolarization changes. When we look at T wave changes in ischemic heart disease, the commonest change which you would encounter is T wave inversion. The T wave inversions which you encounter in ischemic heart disease are usually symmetric and narrow. When we say symmetric, we mean that the descending and the ascending limb of the inversion looks similar. Now, it's usually seen in the situation of an acute coronary syndrome, either unstable angina or a non-ST elevation MI. It can also be seen chronically in a patient with chronic ischemic heart disease as being the changes of an old myocardial infarction. There is generally a certain progression to T-wave inversion. Initially, the terminal part of the T wave inverts, then the change progressively extends to the mid and the initial part of the T wave. So you can have a picture in between where the initial part of the T wave is upright and the terminal part is inverted and this is what would be called a biphasic T wave. So this is an example of an ECG taken from a person during an episode of chest pain. So in the initial clinical scenario which we, which we talked about in a person who comes to you with chest discomfort, if you find a situation like this where there are T-wave inversions, here you can see in the anterior leads, you would be concerned that there is ongoing ischemia here. Now curiously, the other phenomenon can also happen. In someone who has an upright T-wave at baseline, T-wave inversion could convey ischemia. The opposite situation would be where in a person at rest or at baseline, the T wave is actually inverted. In such people, paradoxically, the T waves can become normal looking or they can become upright during an episode of ischemia. And this phenomenon is called pseudo normalization. So one needs to be alert to this possibility and you can recognize this only if you compare it with the baseline ECG. So just like in, with any other investigation, Comparing with the previously available baseline is important in interpreting ischemia as well. The other important finding which one can find in a T wave and something which is particularly important to recognize is what are called hyperacute T waves. We talked about inverted T waves. Now this is the other situation where the T wave amplitude, the upright T wave amplitude is actually exaggerated. Now this is important to recognize because this can be one of the earliest changes which can happen in acute myocardial infarction. All of us are pretty familiar with the phenomenon of ST elevation and most people are 
quite attuned to pick up ST elevation in an ECG and recognize that an acute myocardial infarction is taking place. But one of the things which sometimes is missed with potentially disastrous consequences is the very early finding of hyperacute T waves. As you can see from the panels which are depicted, on the right side you can see the appearance of the T wave in hyperacute ischemia. There is an increase in the amplitude and the important thing to note that it's generally broad based and it's not pointed. And this is important to contrast it with another phenomenon which gives rise to tall T waves which is hyperkalemia. Now that's also a medical emergency of a different sort. In hyperkalemia the T waves are very narrow based and they are tall, they are pointed or tented. Whereas in myocardial ischemia this is not the case. The general criterion which is used to diagnose a hyperacute T wave is a T wave exceeding at least 10 millimeter in the precordial leads or 5 millimeter in the limb leads. So this is an example from a person who walked into the emergency room complaining of chest discomfort which had just started 15 minutes prior to his arrival in the ER. Now when you look at this ECG, at first look you may think well there is no ST elevation and everything looks fine. But if you notice from leads V2 to V4, you can clearly see the presence of very abnormally tall T waves. These are the hyperacute T waves occurring very early with impending anterior wall myocardial infarction. And to send this person off from the ER would not be a wise thing. Another characteristic pattern which one needs to keep in mind because it's a high yield finding is something known as the Wellens sign, which was first described by the famous Dutch electrophysiologist Hein Wellens. This is a characteristic pattern of T wave inversions in a person who's complaining of recent angina. If you can look at this ECG, it shows these kind of biphasic T inversions from V1 to V4. These could be biphasic or these could be symmetric as well. The importance is that in a combination of a person complaining of recent angina, this often suggests a critical lesion in the proximal LAD artery and requires urgent care or urgent intervention. We'll now move on to the changes in the ST segment, which are again something which are quite commonly encountered in ischemic heart disease and it's important to interpret correctly. The ST segment is usually isoelectric. It's not deviated either way from the baseline. This is because during that phase of cardiac activation, all areas of the myocardium are kind of maintained at the same potential. And this is reflected as a flat ST segment. What happens when ischemia occurs in a particular region of the heart is that the electrical potential there is altered. So this sets up a kind of a potential difference between the ischemic area and the normal area. And this gradient causes current to flow from the normal to the abnormal area. This causes a shift in the ST segment. And the other important thing to remember is that ST segment and T wave changes being both components of repolarization generally go hand in hand and commonly they are clubbed together as STT changes. So the two main uh, changes which happen in the ST segment are ST depression and ST elevation. So ST depression is nothing but a deviation of the ST segment below the isoelectric line. So just for you to quickly recollect uh, uh, what the normal isoelectric segment of the ECG is, if you remember it is the PR segment. So whenever we talk about depression or elevation we need to keep the isoelectric line as the PR segment. So an ST depression especially indicates a high probability of ischemia. A lesser degree of ST segment depression somewhere between 0.5 and 1 millimeter indicates an intermediate probability. ST depression is almost always encountered in acute coronary syndrome as far as, this is, as far as the setting of ischemic heart disease is concerned. Other than the magnitude of ST depression, the other thing which you need to look at is the appearance of the ST segment depression. Now if the ST segment depression is horizontal or planar, that is more suggestive of ischemia. On the other hand, if it has an angulation to it, if it's either upsloping or downsloping, then it's less specific. Such ST segment depressions can be encountered in other conditions as well. So this is just a comparison. If you look at the rightmost panel, 
a horizontal ST segment depression, which is kind of parallel to the isoelectric baseline, is highly suggestive of ischemia. The left panel showing an upsloping pattern and the middle panel showing a downsloping panel are less specific and could potentially have other causes other than ischemia. Another important thing to keep in mind is that we talked about localization of the infarct based on a presence of a Q wave in a particular lead. The presence of ST depression can tell you that there is a pathology of ischemia, but it cannot necessarily localize. So here in this particular ECG, you can see that there is ST depression from V1 to V5, but we cannot interpret this as saying that there is ischemia necessarily only in the anterior wall. So ST depression doesn't help us localize, but generally helps us to diagnose ischemia. The other important thing to keep in mind, just as we talked about with pseudonormalization of T waves, is that serial assessments are important because ischemia can sometimes be a transient phenomenon. So if you find one ECG without ST segment depression, and then half an hour later, you take one more ECG and there is ST depression, that finding is quite valuable because it shows that there is a dynamic process going on. And these kind of dynamic STT changes are very valuable in diagnosing ischemia. Now coming to the finding which most of you are familiar with, which is ST elevation. This is the hallmark finding in ST elevation MI or what is called a STEMI. Now, the basic concept is the same. There is an alteration of electrical potential in a region of the ischemic myocardium setting up an electrical gradient. This electrical gradient creates the so-called current of injury which is manifested as an ST elevation on the surface ECG. So here what happens is that this current of injury redirects the ST vector in the area of ischemia from the endocardium to the epicardium. So if you imagine a set of leads which are facing that particular region, the, the leads for example on the chest, they are beyond the surface of the heart, right? So if the ST vector is going to point from endocardium to epicardium, you will find an activation which is coming towards those particular leads. And this is what leads to a elevation of the ST segment above the baseline. Interestingly, if you think about it, what's going to happen in the leads which are facing in the opposite direction? You would find the opposite finding, basically ST depression. So, in an ECG where you find ST elevation in certain leads, you can find ST depression in opposite facing leads and these are called reciprocal ST changes. So what do you need as far as the diagnosis of STEMI is concerned from the ECG? The traditional uh, criteria which are followed to decide especially in taking up the person for a reperfusion therapy such as thrombolysis or in taking them up for an urgent angioplasty is that you should have at least two millimeters of ST elevation in precordial leads or at least one millimeter of ST elevation in limb leads. And again, these should generally be present in at least two contiguous leads. The second thing, just like with ST depression, the morphology or the type of ST elevation is important. Here you can see the classical up coving or up convex ST elevation, which represents ST elevation MI. On the other hand, if you have an ST segment elevation, which is up concave, then that is less specific. And up convex ST elevation is highly ominous. There is also a basic progression of ECG changes in acute MI. Now in acute MI, there is also a serial evolution of ECG changes. This is important to keep in mind because depending on the stage at which you are seeing the patient, you may find one or more of these particular ECG changes. So starting from uh, left to right and from top to bottom, you can see how the baseline ECG changes as the duration of ischemia progresses. The first stage which we have seen before is the occurrence of hyperacute T waves. This is followed by the occurrence of gross ST elevation. Then after some time, typically a matter of hours, the ST elevation starts settling down and the R wave height starts getting lost and you start developing a Q wave. And finally, over a period of days or weeks, the ST elevation completely settles down and you have a Q wave there 
which shows a completed infarct. Typically, these are accompanied by repolarization changes, which is classically the T-wave inversion. And again, over a period of a few weeks, the T-wave inversion can resolve, leaving just the presence of a Q-wave. So there is a particular sequence to how typically the ECG changes in an acute MI progress. Now, similar to Q-waves, the ST segment elevation is also helpful in localizing the area of ischemia. So here I have put up two ECGs side by side and both of them are representing the same underlying pathology. And can you think of what that might be? Look at both ECGs carefully and think about what your diagnosis would be. So the left ECG is showing you hyperacute T waves in the anterior leads without significant or without gross ST elevation. And this is a stage at which you might, you know, tend to erroneously dismiss this as not being indicative of an infarct. But if you repeat the same ECG, say half an hour to one hour later, it could show you a picture similar to what is represented by the right hand side panel. And that shows you clear cut ST elevation in the anterior leads. And therefore, this is an anterior STEMI. You can also see, I have shown you by the arrow, a uh, presence of ST depression in the inferior leads. So can anyone think as to why there is ST depression in the inferior leads in a case of anterior STEMI? Well, if you remember, we talked about the phenomenon of reciprocal ST changes. And this is nothing but basically the presence of reciprocal ST depression in the inferior leads. And this is something which you can often find in an anterior wall STEMI. What do you think this ECG shows? Take a moment to look at it. So you would be hopefully able to recognize the gross ST elevation present in leads 2, 3 and AVF, which are the inferior leads. So this is a case of inferior STEMI. And can you identify which leads are showing the reciprocal ST changes in this case? Yes, you can see that you can see the ST depression in lead 1 and lead AVL. And those are the reciprocal ST changes. What about this ECG? Do you think it represents a myocardial infarction at all? Do you think it represents a STEMI at all? Well, at first look, you may say, I don't think so because I'm just seeing significant uh, ST depression from V1 to V3. But one needs to keep in mind that just as we talked about the finding for a posterior myocardial infarction giving rise to dominant R waves in the anterior leads instead of Q waves, Similarly, an isolated posterior wall MI can just give rise to mirror image ST depressions in the anterior leads from V1 to V3. The way to diagnose this would be to use additional leads, that is posterior leads, which are typically called V7 to V9. And if you place those posterior leads, which I have shown you in the rightmost panel, you can see the ST elevation now in V8 and V9. And therefore, this is actually a STEMI. This is a posterior wall ST elevation MI. So we have now seen some examples of ST elevation MI. Now there can be some conditions where you can have ST elevation without an actual myocardial infarction going on. One of the special considerations is the occurrence of coronary vasospasm. This is a condition where the coronary artery contracts or becomes goes into spasm resulting in a transient cutoff of blood supply to the myocardium. And these people generally come to you with episodes of severe chest pain, which typically resolves within a few minutes. And if you happen to take an ECG during the episode, you would find ST elevation corresponding to the territory of the involved coronary artery. And after the episode settles down, the ECG can completely normalize. So this is one of the causes of a transient ST elevation. The other special consideration one needs to keep in mind is the phenomenon of silent ischemia. Most people who come with acute ischemic changes do have complaints such as chest pain or shortness of breath and so forth. In some patients, especially among diabetics, they may come to you without any symptoms and sometimes ST segment changes especially can be picked up on routine ECG monitoring and these are episodes of silent ischemia which should also be given due importance.
Lastly, we talked about the fact that in stable ischemic heart disease, you may not have much changes on the resting ECG and you may have to actually stress the heart to provoke ischemic changes. One of the commonest way to do that is to do an exercise stress test or a treadmill test. And this basically shows a tracing from a treadmill test where you can see that in a person who had a normal resting ECG, when he was made to walk and the heart rate increased, there was significant ST depression in multiple ECG leads. Here you can see this ST depression happening in inferior leads as well as in the lateral leads and this indicates the presence of underlying coronary artery disease. Again, these ST depressions will not necessarily localize the area which is involved but it would tell you that there is underlying ischemic heart disease. So in summary, some of the basic principles you should remember in interpreting an ECG in ischemic heart disease is that ischemia predominantly affects repolarization and causes STT changes. Infarction mainly affects depolarization and affects the QRS complex with the Q wave being one of the hallmark manifestations. Hyperacute T waves are something to keep in mind. They are an early sign of myocardial infarction and should not be missed. And the last important thing to keep in mind that whenever possible, you should try to do serial assessment by multiple ECGs so that you can pick up dynamic changes. Changes which are appearing and disappearing within a short span of time are quite valuable and convey a high likelihood of ischemia.